So hello everyone, uh, I'm Fu Li Feng uh, from the University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, welcome to join our tutorial regarding the caudal recommendation. And as we all know, uh, caudal recommendation receives uh, great attention in recent years. And there appears many studies uh, with different caudal technologies to deal with different problems in recommendation. In this tutorial, we will give an overview of the pro uh, progresses of the causality aware recommendation and present some open problems and future directions for this for this uh, area. This tutorial is organized by uh, Zhang Yang, uh, Yang Zhang and Xiang Nanhe from University of uh, Science and Technology of China and Wen Jie Wang from National University of Singapore and Dr. Uh, Peng Wu from Peking University. This is the outline of our tutorial. So uh, there are mainly two parts. At the first part, uh, I will give a brief introduction of this tutorial. And then uh, Dr. Wu Peng will give an overview of the potential outcome uh, model based on recommendation, uh, followed by a five minutes uh, Q&A session. Then we will, we will take a break about 10 minutes. At the second part, uh, at first, uh, Yang Zhang and Wen Jie Wang will uh, introduce the structure caudal model based recommendation and followed by a, a brief comparison between the potential outcome framework and the caudal structure model framework. Lastly, uh, I, will, uh, I will present some open problems and future directions and give a conclusion of this tutorial. And at last, uh, it will, uh, it will, there will be another five minutes uh, for Q&A session. And in the Q and uh, in the question answer session, you can directly type the question in the chat box, or you can raise your hand with the hand up uh, button, uh, or you you just speak it up. So uh, let us begin. So as we all know, uh, we are living in an era of information explore, uh, explosion. For example, there are over millions of products. On the e-commerce, we are uh, on the e-commerce platforms we are using. Uh, we are using daily, such as the Amazon, the Taobao, and Jingdong, uh, so on and so forth. And there are many. Uh, there are over. There are billions of users in the social networks uh, like Facebook. We are we are using, and in all of these platforms, the amount of information is increasing uh, rapidly. For example, uh, for the content sharing platforms. Uh, on every day, uh, for the platforms like YouTube, on uh, every day, there are about uh, 720,000 20, hours videos uploaded. So uh, aiming, to, uh, aiming to facilitate us to, uh, to address the information uh, overload, recommend the system has become, uh, has been recognized as a powerful tool and the, the key, uh, the key target of recommend system is to provide us, uh, is to recommend us the proper, the proper items or the proper contents, uh, so so that we can, uh, we can, we can get the information, we can get the information uh, that makes our interest without, uh, without a lot of explorations. And most of the uh, most of the current recommended system follow a works workflow with uh, three main steps. The first step is training a recommended model um, from the observed user item interaction data. For example, uh, we can collect. Uh, for example, uh, taking the, the click request um, in an e-commerce platform as an example. So we can use the click behaviors. We, we have used the historical click behaviors uh, from user on the on the on the products uh, to train to train a recommended model. And after after uh, after training the model, we deploy this model online, and this model will infer uh, will infer the uh, preference score of each rec over each recommend uh, over each item on the platform, and then um, give a give a recommendation list, for example, uh, by, by returning the top, 
top n items uh, ranked by this uh, by this preference score. And after serving the the user, um, the user will will give some feedbacks, for example, click some items in the recommendation list, and then we can collect these new behaviors and merge all these new behaviors into the um, the previous training data to get a to get a new training data set. And then we use the new training data set to update the model. And then uh, we then we form a, a loop with these three steps. So this is the uh, this is mainly the uh, the workflow of current recommender systems. And the core of this uh, of this uh, workflow is the recommender model. And currently, we so we uh, train uh, we 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 solve recommendation as a machine learning problem. So we train recommender recommender models by minimizing the difference between the historical feedback or historical uh, interactions and the model prediction to optimize the model parameters. For example, if we uh, if we take the uh, take the rating score as as an as an example, so for example, uh, here one one row uh, represents an item, maybe one column represents a user, and therefore, so each entry is the is a rating uh, given by a user on item, and then the model is to uh, the the model uh, is exactly to to fit of these rating scores, so the model makes prediction for our entry for this uh, for 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 these ratings. And the core idea of building of building recommend model a uh, recommender model is uh, as collaborative filtering. So the idea is uh, similar uh, similar users will perform similarly in the future, and uh, our community. Have witnessed uh, were various effective recommend, uh, recommender models, and roughly the development the development of previous recommender models are in two phases. The one, uh, the first phase is about the shallow uh, shallow models, which performs shallow representation learning. That is to say, the model takes the raw feature, for example, the user ID and item ID, and some even some uh, some uh, feature vector and then um, the model will get uh, will, will directly map all of these features to a user representation and an item representation or a representation of this user item pair and then make prediction directly from these representations and the second phase of the recommended model is uh, is a uh, is about neural representation learning and this is because of the development of deep neural networks and only, only to the uh, extraordinary uh, representation ability of deep neural networks, then um, uh, people in our community uh, use uh, or introduce uh, the advanced the deep neural networks to, uh, to learn user and item uh, representations. For example, there are uh, neural collaborative filter mo models that learns uh, user and item representations from user ID and item ID. And there are also graph neural networks that, uh, for recommendation that uh, encodes the structure of this user item interaction by parallel graph. And there are also sequential models that takes uh, the, for example, the historical interactions, uh, historical behaviors of user as a sequence and to learn a user representation. And there are also uh, there are also more recommended models that uh, that is that are equipped with uh, Tysro and Vero encoders to encode uh, such set information into the item representations. And uh, with the development of uh, of this uh, all of these recommend existing recommended models, the core of the, these models is learning the correlation. Between the input features, no matter it is uh, user user item IDs or the set information, and the uh, the targeted interaction labels. However, there are uh, uh, clear shortcomings of these data driven models that focuses on the on learning correlations. Um, 
for example, um, in recommendation, uh, in recommended systems, uh, the data, there are many biases in data. For example, uh, this is because the data is observational rather than it's uh, experimental and the data is uh, missing not at random because uh, because the data are collected from previous recommendation uh, policy or then there are many factors, for example, whether the item is uh, exposed or, or which position the item is run. They, are all, they, they all influence whether the item will be inter uh, interacted by the user or not. And um, at the same time, uh, the collected data, the, or whether the interaction will happen or not is also uh, affected by a lot of uh, hidden factors such as the public opinions or the, uh, or the, uh, or the latest event such as the, the, pand uh, the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, uh, in the recommended data, there are also uh, drift problems. This is because uh, we have feed, feed, feedback loop and all the things change a long time. For example, user and item features change a long time. People, uh, the income or the memory status of a user will change a long time. And at the same time, the properties of item also change. Even though the value of its feature may not change, but the, pre, uh, the inherent property changes. For example, the, the iPhone 12 in 20, 2021 is a new, a new, uh, new phone. Uh, it's just released. But after one year, all of its configs or its parameters are, are, also the, are still the same. But it, it is not a, it's a, it is not a, a, a new phone. No. So, uh, so uh, recommend, recommend, recommend model faces off the streets. And at the same time, uh, user preference also drifts. So uh, blindly uh, learning cor data correlations will will not uh, cannot will face of this of the issues. So that is to say, um, for the current data driven recommended models, learning correlation uh, is not equal is not equal to uh, learning preference. And our uh, for 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 uh, for researchers that that uh, that works on causal uh, uh, for researchers that is familiar with causality. So um, we believe the the key reason for this phenomenon is that uh, correlations may not reflect the true causes of interaction. And so uh, we. If we dive into the sources of correlations, there are uh, basically three types of correlation. The first one, uh, the first one is is the correlation is correlation that is uh, which is equal to uh, causation. That means, uh, for example, um, the correlation between for uh, preference and behavior, which is which is the cause of behavior. And but there are also some other reasons that can uh, cause correlation, for example, confounding. Uh, for example, uh, if a product has a high quality, then it will, it will result in a uh, high price. At the same time, people may uh, give high rating to a product with high quality. So with, with this common cause, the, uh, the high price and the preference Will uh will show some correlation, but this kind of correlation uh with this kind of correlation uh recommend model will blindly uh, or recommend or over recommend the products with high price. And there is another source for correlation which is co collision. So that is uh that is because for two factor um influence uh, another factor at the same time. For example, interest will, uh, will, result, will uh, affect click and popularity also affect click. Then if we control, uh, control the status of click, so that is to say if we only, uh, only focus on the, the, the user item pairs with positive clicks, then there will be a correlation between interest and popularity. And which is one of the sources uh, for popularity bars. 
so I, as I just uh, uh, as I just introduced in this uh, uh, in the previous slide, so uh, the current data driven recommend models they will um, by fitting by fitting the data correlation they may uh, learn good user preference uh, different from the true uh, preference distribution. So this is the reason. This is also the reason why we uh why we pursue a uh, causal recommendation. And the main target for causal recommendation is to understand the inherent causal mechanism of uh, user behaviors. That is to, to say, uh, why this kind of uh, why this kind of data is generated. And with uh more work with uh with all of these causal relations. Uh, we can make uh, reliable and explainable uh, recommendations. That is the same uh, when we incorporate ca ca causality with correlation, we will get better, uh, we will get more reliable and explainable recommendations. With all of these benefits, um, research in our community, researchers in our communities has, uh, has Develop uh, a series of causal recommendation uh, works, and this is uh, this existing uh, works are mainly uh, in two uh, categories regarding the uh, causal framework used in this work. The first work is the is the parental outcome framework, and the other uh, other work is a, a structural causal work. These two guys are. Uh, uh, very famous in the in the uh, in the area of causality, and with these two frameworks, um, the current research uh, on causal recommendation mainly solving the evaluation, embarrassing explanation, fairness, robustness, and all the generalization this, uh, these issues in recommendation. So roughly, this is the roadmap of causal recommendation. Uh, now I will pass to Dr. Wu Peng for the details of this uh, of the parental account framework. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, next, uh, let me show my screen. Okay. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce some recent works on causal recommendation within the potential outcome framework. Uh, this topic includes six sections. Firstly, we will briefly introduce the potential outcome framework, which is the basis for defining a recommendation task formally. Then we introduce three basic methods in which preference goal, error imputation based method, and the W no bust method. Next, we discuss the limitations of these three basic methods and to overcome their limitations, a series of enhanced W no bust methods are developed and we will introduce them in sections in sections four and five. Finally, Snow presenting a cause analysis framework. We give formal causal definitions of various bases in recommendation. Let's see the first section. In fields of causal inference, a unified workflow of investigating causal problems consists of three steps. In the first step, define a causal estimate to answer the scientific question. Uh, a causal estimate is also called a causal parameter. In the second step, we discuss the uh, discoverability and identifiability of the estimate given the data collected. Finally, build models to derive the consistent estimator of the estimate, thereby drawing conclusions. The unified workflow is called causal analysis framework. 
this field goal displays the relationship of the three steps in the causal analysis framework, step one and step two and uh, step three. Uh, the potential outcome framework is mainly used in to define the causal estimate in step one uh, is here. Uh, it should be noted that the first step exists in the imaginary world, while the data and the models exist in the real world. Essentially, causal problems is, a, is counterfactual and exist only in the imaginary world. Uh, what a causal inference does is to build a model with real world data to answer the counterfactual questions. To define a recommend, uh, to define a recommendation task clearly, we should first know the key key components of, of the potential outcome framework. There are six elements: unit, target population, treatment, outcome, potential outcome, and the estimate. Well, the unit is the most fine, fine grained research subject. The target population is the population that we want to make an inference or prediction on. And the causal estimate is the causal parameter of interest, providing a recipe for answering the scientific question of interest for any hypothesis data. Now we return to the recommendum system. Uh, in recommendum system, a unit is usually a user item pair. The target population usually consists of all user item pairs. We denote it as Mexico D. Uh, the treatment is often the exposure status denoted as OUI. It is a binary, uh, a binary variable where all your i equals to one or zero denotes the item is, is exposed to user u or large. The outcome is the feedback of a user item pair. We denote it as RUI. And then the potential outcome RUI1 or RUI0. Uh, which is defined as the outcome that would be observed if all UI had been set to O. And here we uh, define XUI as the feature or the embeddings of user and item pair. Uh, in RS, the feedback uh, could, be the, could be the click, purchase, or download. Uh, this field goal presents the typical data collected in recommendum system. The data marked in gray is the observed data. And for each user item pair, only one of the potential outcome is observed. Uh, this raises some problems for the data driven methods. In recommendum system, we often want to answer the intervention question. If recommended, if recommended an item to a user, what would be the feedback formally? It implies that the estimate is the expectation of RUI conditional on XUI, as shown in question one. It requires to predict the outcome RUI1 using the feature XUI. Let's see some examples for this estimate in question one. The first example is the scenario of video websites, where the outcome is the true rating of user U for video I, and all UI represent the observing indicator of RUI, it means that 
IUI is observed if and only if all UI equals to one. Table one presents the data structure of example one, where RUI is missing when all UI equals to zero. Uh, this is the uh, blank, uh, blank uh, uh, area. We want to predict the writing for all user item pairs. In this case, we can regard the observing indicator all UI as the treatment and, and then define RUI1 as the true rating if all UI equals to one for all the user item pairs. Here, we define RUI1 instead of using RUI to underline the true stage, the outcome is part of observable. The scientific question predicting the rating for all user item pairs then can be represented as the equation one. Next, we give two extra examples. One is the CTR prediction task. Well, RUI is the indicator of a click and all, and all UI equals to one. If, if item I is exposed to user U, then the, the CTR can be defined exactly the estimate of equation one. Uh, here is the data structure. Uh, this data structure has the almost uh, the same data, uh, data structure as in example one. The other is the task of CVR prediction. We, in this example, RUI is the purchase status and all UI is the click status. Then the estimate in question one is exactly the definition of post-click CVR. And the data structure is exactly the same as in dash in example two. Here, uh, here are some comments of the potential outcome framework. It's important to note that the definition of causal estimate here, here we focus on estimate. Uh, uh, we focus on this estimate in question one. Uh, the definition of a cost estimate do not involve data collected and the model adopted. It also doesn't involve the relationship between XUI, OUI, and RUI. In other words. When defining cost estimate using potential outcome framework, it needn't distinguish confounder, collider, mediator, and so on. Snow, formula, snow formalizing the scientific question into a causal estimate, we can answer the following questions. What exactly being estimated and for what purpose? purpose? Uh, actually, one of the main contributions that causal inference has brought is a focus on clearly defined estimates before building models. Next, uh, we introduce three basic approaches to deal with, to deal with the selection bias and the confounding bias by using the potential outcome framework. All the three examples given in section one can be seen as a missing data problem. Therefore, a basic problem in recommended system is missing data with the language of causal inference. Missing data can be seen as a selection bias or confounding bias problem. It means that the distrib distribution of this column uh, this, col this column with all UI equals to one is different from 
those with all your i equals to zero. That's a recommendation model trained with the data with all your i equals to one would not suitable for the data with all your i equals to zero. Currently, most of the causal recommendation methods focus on missing data problem in addition. Since the missing rate is very high in, recommenda in recommendation, this problem is called sparsity. Uh, we can say that only 2% of the outcomes are observed in the Yahoo ASHRAE data. So uh, this missing data, uh, so 98% of data are missing. And we on, only observed 2% for data. To predict the RUI1, we need to build a model. Net F5 XUI be a recommendation model with, with parameter five. Then to train the parameter, we need to define a loss function. In an ideal case, if all the potential outcome RUI1 will observe the, the ideal loss function for chain five is given in for equation two, where EUI is the prediction error or loss function, such as the least square loss. Noticing that RUI1 is observed only when all UI equals to one. So EUI is computable only when all UI equals to one. As such, the, in, the ideal loss function is infeasible. So various methods were proposed to construct unbiased loss function of the ideal loss. And uh, this is the mainline of device methods in causal recommendation with the potential outcome framework. A natural idea is to remove the unobserved data and only use the non-missing data to train the recommendation model. This is the idea of a naive estimator, whose uh, loss function is given in here. Well, the mask O is the set of exposed events. Uh, we can we can show that. The loss function of naive estimator converts to the expectation of EUI conditional on all UI equals to one. So we can see that uh, for the randomized controlled data or uniform data, uh, in this case, EUI one is independent of all UI then the naive estimator is an unbiased estimate of the ideal loss. Otherwise, the naive loss function is a biased estimator. Oh. Since the observed data is usually not corrected, slow, well-designed choice, so naive estimator is biased and the corresponding recommendation model is in general suboptimal. A classical unbiased estimate is the inverse preference goal called IPS. It is defined as the equation four. The IPS estimator involves a nuisance parameter called the parameter goal, which is the probability of all UI equals to one, given X UI. 
the ambassador's the ambassador's property of IPS estimator is based on the following assumption given in equation five. This is a common assumption called the unconfoundedness assumptions or backdoor criterion. It implies that XUI blocks all the backdoor pairs between OUI and RUI. Under this assumption, we can prove that given if the preliminary goal is, is accurate, then we have the following uh, equations. Well, the second uh, equation follows by the law of iterated expectations. The third equation follows for the unconfoundedness assumptions. And the PUI is a function of XUI. So we have, so we can show that IPS estimator is unbiased estimator of the ideal loss function. If the, if the estimation of problem principle is accurate, IPS approach aims to recover the distribution of all the events by relating the exposed events with the inverse of Prolympian's goal. A limitation of IPS estimator is, is it a large variance problem. That is, when some Prolympian's goal values are small, the inverse of each will become extremely large. I improved, the, I, I improved the version of IPS is self normalized IPS, which is given us in this equation. So no normalizing the ways the self normalized IPS often has no variance than the IPS estimator. But it will, but it brings a small bias. Another approach is error imputation based method called EIB. The EIB estimator is given in equation six. Well, EUI hat is, uh, is an error imputation model with parameter phi, uh, with parameter theta. That face the prediction error EUI using feature XUI. So it estimates GUI defined by the conditional expectation. Given the imputed errors, we have the following equations. For, uh, for the last uh, identity, we can say that if EUI ha uh, is an accurate of GUI, then the EIB estimator is unbiased. The last basic message is doubly robust joint learning called DRGL, which is given us in question seven. DR estimator is constructed by comp combining both EIB and the IPS mercies. IPS focuses on the relationship between the feature XUI and the treatment OUI, but pay no heed to the relationship between feature XUI and the, the outcome OURUI. While the EIB is just the opposite, in contrast, DR focus on both of them. For DR, for double robust loss function, joint learning is a common technique used to train the parameter. Specifically, given the estimator of theta, the parameter phi in the recommendation model is updated by minimizing the DR loss, given the estimator of phi, the parameter theta is updated. 
by minimize the loss function in equation eight. DR estimator has the property of a doubly robustness. Uh, here is the proof given the estimation of PUI ha and the EUI ha. Uh, we can show that if either EUI ha equals to GUI or the parameters go equals to uh, the estimation of parameters go equals to uh, the true parameters go, then the ideal loss is. Uh, then the DR loss function is unbiased. Uh, this is the property of a double, double no bust. In section three, we discussed the limitations of the previous basic device methods. There are five design, uh, there are five desired properties for in value Eighteen device mercies, including W no bust, no bust to small propensities, boundness without extrapolation, no variance. Failing to meet any of them may lead to suboptimal performance. Table one compares the basic device mercies in these five aspects where the symbols tick or cross denotes good, medium, and bad respectively. Uh, for this figure, we can see that the IPS, EIB, and the DR methods only enjoy uh, three or few of the desired properties. Next, uh, we explain these properties in detail. As shown in section two, DR enjoys the property of a double robustness in contrast. IPS and EIB do not meet the property of double robustness. And both the IPS and the DR use the inverse of prepense goal as the way to not cover the Target population in the presence of small propensities, the waste will become extremely large and cause and cause instability. In contrast, EIB not such such uh, does not suffer such such a problem. Self normalized IPS could mitigate. Part of this question by normal like normal normalize normalizing the ways, then we have the conclusion of the first column and the second column. Uh, and uh, both the IPS and the DR may lie outside the range of ideal rules. That is, they did, did not enjoy the property of boundaries. That is because the universe of propensity is unbounded. For example, if we set EOI belongs to the interval from zero to one, then the ideal loss function must belong to this interval. While IPS and the DR may not B within this range. The EIB could guarantee boundless property easily only if the error imputation model is chosen appropriately. Then we have the conclusion of the third column. Only SNPs and uh, self normalized IPS and uh, EIB could have the boundless property, and uh, the other one do not enjoy this property. 
uh, and the EIB usually has a large bias which is a consequence of making implicit extrapolation. Specifically, the error imputation model is trained with exposed events while using their predicted values for all events. This relies on heavily, this relies on extrapolation since the, since the exposed events are sparse, are sparse and there may exist a significant difference between the distribution of exposed events and unexposed events. Thus, it's hard to get accurate error imputation and leads to poor performance. In, comp in comparison, the estimation of Prolympian's goal doesn't rely on extrapolation since the Prolympian score is estimated with the whole sample. Then we get the conclusion of the fourth column. The Merced based on Prolympian score do not have the problem of extrapolation and the other two uh, have this problem. Finally, we can show that EIB has the smallest small, smaller, smallest variance among these estimations. This results is presented in theorem one. Theorem one shows that the variance of EIB estimator less than the R estimator, not than the IPS estimator, where the equality holds if and only if PUI equals to one for all use item pairs, that is, there is no missing values. It also shows that when the Prolympian's goal tends to zero, the variance of IPS and the DR tends to infinity and the EIB tends to its minimal value. Then we have the conclusion of the fifth column. EIB has the small, small, smallest variance and the IPS has large variance. Uh, among these basic mercies, DR generally shows superior performance, performance recently. So strength of enhanced approaches were proposed. Uh, they are three typical enhanced mercies. The more robust, doubly robust, called MRDR which tries to find a better bus variance should of compared with the basic DRGL merced. And the, the double bus tact learning is a new merced that can effectively capture the merits of both EIB and the DR. And the multitask learning use the parameter sharing technique to improve the accuracy of the recommendation model. Let's say the method of MRDR. MRDR, huh? MRDR enhance the robustness of the basic DRGL by optimizing the variance of the DR estimator when train the imputation model uh, for ease of comparison, we call the DR loss function. And uh, the left panel is the L group. The, the left panel is the 
procedures of DRGL. Uh, and the right panel is the algorithm of MRDR. It can be seen that MRDR keeps the loss function of recommendation model unchanged while replacing the loss function of imputation model in DRGL with the following loss function in the right bottom. This is the only difference between these two methods. A natural question is why why can this why this sub substitution can can work? The idea is that this substitution can reduce the variance of DR estimator, and hence a monobust estimator may be achieved. Uh, formally, it can be formulated as the following question. We compute the variance of DR loss function with back to O. And uh, we can say that uh, the variance is, is exactly the form of uh, loss function used to train the error imputation model. Uh, next, uh, we introduce the doubly robust tactic learning method. Recall the limitations of the basic methods. We have the following conclusions. DR generally, out, generally outperforms the IPS in terms of both bias and variance. When compared with EIB, DR tends to have a smaller bias, while EIB has a smaller variance. So it involves a bias and a variance should off. Uh, ideally, it is desirable to develop a method that can capture the merits of both of them. So then it will have smaller bias and also has smaller variance. To achieve this goal, we should first know the relationship between DR and EIB. They can be related via the correction term. Specifically, it's noted that DR loss function can be decom can be write as EIB loss function and a correction term. This implies that the correction term use from pencil goal to estimate how much EIB overestimate or underestimate the ideal loss function and then subtract it as a compromise. The correction term will increase the variance of DR estimator according to the theorem one. That if the error imputation model is computed in a manner that uh, such that the equation nine holds, then the EIB would have a small bias and the DR would have a small variance. Mm -hmm. uh, some may argue that this constraint nine may degrade the uh, ac degrade the ac accuracy of EUI half. Uh, actually, by leveraging the targeted maximum likelihood estimating technique, DRTMLE, 
obtains an estimate of EUI half that satisfies equation nine without satisfying the accuracy of an elementation model. And uh, table two presents the properties of DRTMLE. Uh, we can say that uh, DRTMLE enjoys the good properties of both EIB and the DR. Uh, what is the TMLE technique? Uh, without loss of generality, suppose, suppose that the error imputation model can be presented as EUI half. The following, following questions. Uh, will H is an arbitrary function, phi is a no function, such as identity, sigmoid, Uh, the basic idea of TMLE consists of two steps. Step one is initialization. A pre train uh, initial pre imputation estimate will denote it as your hard zero. Uh, it can be derived by using the existing W no bus merges uh, like uh, DRJL and uh, MRDR. And the step two is the target step. Uh, this is the key step. It updates the initial estimate EOHH zero by fitting an extended one parameter model which includes a single, var single, var single variable, the inverse of prime principle minus one and the offset of the initial estimator. Then the, then the RTMLE estimate is giving us the following equation which also has the same form of the DR loss function, but with a different error imputation model. Here are some comments for the TMLE technique. Uh, it can be seen that, uh, it can be proved that the target step in TMLE could ensure that the updated uh, error imputation model satisfies the equation nine. And uh, since the target step updates the error imputation model by adding an uh, error correction term to, approxi to approximate EOI have better and hence does not sacrifice the accuracy of imputation model. Uh, DR TMLE requires a pre trained principal model. However, a concern is that if the estimating of principal goal is inaccurate, then the target step in TMLE cannot guaranteed to provide uh, a the correct direction of device and the variance induction. To cope with this problem, a novel TMLE based collaborative target learning approach will develop, which pushes an optimal strategy for estimation of preemptions goal and the error imputation model. Uh, table three reports. Uh, the performance of various device merges using MSE, AOC, NDCG5, and NDCG10 as metrics. We can say that uh, the proposed TMLE estimators are in achieved by single step and uh, collaborative tactical.
and we can see that uh, the TMLE based mercies outproof the baseline mercies significant in all in all metrics. And uh, another enhanced way to is the parameter sharing. Can say the uh, typical e-commerce e transition scenarios as shown in the left figure, where all UI denotes the exposure and CUI denotes the click and RUI denotes the process. In this case, the post view CTR prediction task can be presented as this estimate. And the post click CVR prediction task, which takes CUI as treatment and this task could write as this estimate. The multi-task IPS estimate is given us in this equation, which has the same form of the basic IPS estimate, but as a part of parameter sharing. Well, the parameter goal denotes the CTR and the recommendation model is the CVR and the file rep represents the shared embedding parameter This figure shows the model. This figure shows the model architecture of multi IPS. So the key point, uh, the key point is this uh, uh, structure. It shows uh, uh, it it, uh, it use the parameter sharing technique. Uh, why parameter sharing might work? Recall that there are two challenges in recommended system, missing data and the data sparsity. The progress versus mainly focus on the missing data problem, but pay little attention to the data sparsity problem. Since the training sample with all exposures for CTR task is much richer than the CVR task, thus the parameter sharing mechanism enables CVR network to learn from unclicked exposures and provides great help for deal with the data sparsity trouble. Uh, following the same idea, the multitask W bus estimate is given us in this equation. Well, the, the key component is the parameter phi. It represents the share the embedding parameter among all the tasks, including CV, CTR prediction, CVR prediction, and the imputation task. Uh, next, we introduce some approaches that use a large of the biased data set and a small unbiased data set. Uh, and uh, 
the observational data, we, we usually call it as bus data, and the, the uniform data, we usually call it uh, uniform, uh, call it unbiased data. In the case, uh, well, if we, if we have, uh, we don't have uh, uniform data set, then the parameters goal is often estimated with not just regression or matrix factorization. That is, we estimating all UI using XUI. And when we have access to a small set of uniform data, then we can use naive bias to estimate the parameters goal. In this case, the parameters goal is defined as this equation, and using the bias formula, formula, they can be represented as the right equation. And then we the demonent uh, can be trained with the uniform data, and the numerator can be obtained by using the biased data. So we can use the small uniform data set to derive a better parameters goal estimators. In addition to estimating parameters goal, the uniform data has many other usages. Before presenting the scenarios of and the associated device measures, discussing the character of biased data and unbiased data are helpful to distinguish their respective nodes they played. The biased data is also called as observational data and the unbiased data is called uniform data or randomized controlled data. Uh, the biased data often has a large sample size, so it can capture more user performance informants. Uh, so it can capture more user information about the target population. However, it's inevitable to suffer various biases, which will destroy the causal conclusions. In, con in contrast, the sample size of unbiased data is much smaller. However, corrected snow are carefully designed the experiments. The unbiased data has no bias. So it provides a gold standard for evaluating the debiasing approaches. Ideally, the recommendation model should be trained using unbiased data. Uh, however, this approach will lead to severe overfitting due to the small sample size. Hence, a pragmatic strategy is to combine a large data set and a small unbiased data set. Uh, a natural question is whether the unbiased data is helpful to improve the quality of recommendation. Intuitively, the unbiased data provides a better way to evaluate the recommendation model, so it may give a better op optimization direction for training the model parameters. Now, the key point is how to use the unbiased data. In general, the biased data are applied to obtain better parameters goal model or error imputation model. Uh, just uh, we say the 
base, uh, the naive base method. And, and uh, one, it at all, use the biased data to learn the Plumpensko model, such that the recommendation model for performs well on the unbiased data. Formally, this goal can be formulated as a bi-level optimization problem. Well, eta is the parameter of Plumpensko model, and phi is the parameter of recommendation model. And we train eta with the unbiased data and the choice of the loss function. And we train the parameter phi use the biased data set, uh, such as the previous double no biased loss function. Another method of the device applies the unbiased data to train both the Plumpensko model and the error imputation model. In this, it has a more flexible form of the loss function of recommendation model, which is giving us this equation. Well, the nuisance parameter W UI1, WI2, and the MUI are three functions modeled with parameter phi, uh, eta corresponding to the inverse Plumpensko goal and the uh, error imputation model. How to combine a large biased data set and a small unbiased data? Flexibility is a promising direction to improve the quality of recommendation. In the next section, we give formal causal definitions of various biases in the recommendation. The, introdu the introduction of uh, causal techniques into recommendation system has brought great development to this field and uh, has gradually become a trend. Technically speaking, the existence of various biases is the main, is the main barrier to draw causal conclusions for observational data. Yet, many causal-based prediction and device studies rarely discuss the causal interpretation or discuss the real rationality of the corresponding causal assumptions. In our world, formal definitions of basis in recommendation are still not clear. Which leads to difficulty in discussing theoretical properties and the limitations of various device approaches. In this greatly in the development of uh, causal based recommendation. In recommend in recommendation system, there are many bases as introduced by uh, free form. Uh, it includes selection bias, conformity bias, exposure bias, inductive bias, popularity bias. And uh, more details can be found in this review work. Uh, however, all these definitions in recommendation system are descriptive and uh, uh, in contrast, uh, uh, in fields of causal inference, they also has they also have many biases. Uh, 
and the, the biases are resulted from non compact non com non com from non com no non comparing interference on matched confounder and uh, observed confounder and the selection and or model misspecification specification and then all these buses are well studied in causal inference and then they exist formal and the causal definitions of them therefore if we can build a connection between the buses in the command system and the biases in causal inference, then we may give a formal causal definitions of various biases in the command system. We call the causal analysis framework which is a unified workflow investigating causal problems. It consists of three steps. In the first step, we you define the cost estimate using the potential outcome framework. And in the second step, we discuss the recoverability and the the capability or identifiability of the estimate given the data collected. And finally, we build the models to derive the estimate of the estimate, thereby drawing conclusions. As shown in this figure, we need a variety of assumptions to drive flow association to causality and well nating these assumptions may result in various biases. This perspective provides a unified way to discuss different biases in the command system. Table three clearly presents the most common assumptions in causal inference and establish their connections to the, to the biases in the command system, from which we can define the biases in the command system formally using the language of causal inference. It also provides an opportunity to apply the, the existing causal inference methods to the command system. For example, the non-compliance problem and the interference problem has been intently studied in causal inference. While it is rarely been dis di discussed in the command system. In addition, for the unique characters of recommend system, we expect that a series of new methods will be developed by weakening or substituting the assumptions. Uh, for the uh, limited time, we will not explain these conclusions in table three. Uh, more details can be found in this two work. Uh, that's all, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yang Zhang from the University of Science and Technology of China. Welcome back to our tutorial. Next, I will introduce the structural cost model based recommendation with Wen Jie from the National University of Singapore. First, I will give a brief introduction for structural cost model and uh, then introduce confounding and uh, colliding recommendation. Wen Jie will introduce the confidential recommendation. Uh, Functionally, structural cost model is a mathematical language to represent our causal substance about the world. The causal substance could be some uh, common understanding about the world, such as disease cause the symptoms instead of the inverse one. 
to express the uh, to express the understanding, we can take use a set of structural uh, equations. In this example, let x denote uh, disease and y denote uh, symptoms. Then x is determined by a equation of some arms overcome factors u x and uh, the symptom y is determined determined by a equation of x and other arms of the uh, factors u y. However, take taking equation is not enough to express the inherent uh, directionality in our standing sense. X can uh, also be represented with or equation with uh, or equation with of y. Thus, to express the uh, inherent directionality, we take use cost graph, which is a directed graph and uh, the uh, the right one. Um, in the graph, a direct edge from the x to uh, y could express x causes y instead of the inverse, and the mission edges present the claim of zero influence, uh, and it's it's obvious that a graph could uh, represent many different sets of uh, structural equations, as long as the uh, causal directions are the same among the uh, variables. Indeed, in, indeed, uh, the cost graph is the uh, most important in SM, and this example showing to compute the cost effect of X and Y. If we have known the cost graph, we can represent the target cost effect with correlation level objective. This means that uh, we can estimate the target cost objective uh, from the distribution of observed variables without knowing the detailed uh, structural equations. So uh, that's the cost graph is the most important uh, in SM. Regarding the cost graph, there are three basic cost structures. The first one is the chain structure, uh, assuming X affects Y through a mediator uh, variable. In this case, X and Y are correlated and uh, about condition on Z. Uh, X and Y would be independent. That means controlling Z would block the causal path between X and Y. The second is a compounding structure as shown in the graph. Uh, Z affects uh, both X and uh, uh, Y. Then it is a confounder between X and Y. In this case, X and Y uh, are, uh, in this case, X does not affect Y, but X and Y are cor correlated. This is superior correlation followed by the confounder Z. But if we condition on Z, and X and Y would be independent. Uh, the last one is the colliding structure and showing the uh, red figure. Uh, Z is affected by both X and uh, uh, Y, then Z is a collider. In this example, uh, X and Y are independent, but X and Y would be correlated if we condition on Z. Uh, this thus it's also, uh, but uh, even, uh, even we can, we controlling Z, uh, there are no causal relations between X and Y. So thus this, uh, it's also, the, uh, it, it is also superior correlations. As shown, in the, as shown in the last slide, the correlation could be brought, brought by confounders or condition colliders instead of just of causal relations. Uh, thus, correlation is not causation. Causations. And we cannot answer causal questions such as questions about causal effect and confounders with correlation level tools. SCM provides us an easy tool uh, named do calculus, which provides us various principles to identify target cost effect. For example, we can take use the boundary adjustment to estimate the cost effect when there are confounders. In summary, uh, SCM provides uh, us a mathematic foundations and a friendly calculus for the uh, analysis of our causes and the confounders. With SM, we can answer the following three types of questions. The first one is about the estimation of cost effect. It is to answer the questions about what's the, inf what's the uh, cost influence of B on A. 
Uh, the second one is to answer confidential questions such as uh, if if event B had been uh, had been different, whether the event A would happen. The third one is to estimate uh, the or eliminate the direct or indirect effect, which is usually based on um, confidentials. For example, as shown in the graph, in some cases we lead to uh, in some case we lead the uh, direct effect of x and y represented by the uh, blank edge. Uh, but in some other case, we lead the a we lead the indirect effect uh, represented by the uh, red path. These three types of coastal questions has corresponding has corresponding studies in recommendation. Regarding the first type of coastal questions, studies in, studies in recommendation focus on uh, focus on dealing with the confounders and the colliders. The later two coastal questions correspond to counterfactual recommendations. In the next. I will introduce the work related to uh, confounding and uh, colliding uh, in recommendation, and uh, Wen Jie will give an overview of the counterfactual recommendation. For confounding, for confounding in recommendation, I will first, first introduce the confounders in recommendation and followed by uh, two lines of work to deal with the observed confounders and unobserved confounders, respectively. Regarding the confounding for recommendation, the first question is that other confounders uh, the in recommendation. As we all know, recommender systems and users are in complicated uh, environments with complex causal mechanisms. Thus, the answer is obviously yes. There are three type, there are three examples. The first one is the item quality of both item price and uh, uh, click. Uh, so Item quality is a confounder between the price and the click. And the item brand is also a confounder between item feature, uh, is a confounder sense it affects both the item feature and uh, the brand also affects the click. Even the recommender's uh, algorithm itself can be, uh, be a confounder sense it can expose which item to expose and uh, it can, affects the exposure position of the item. Uh, in these examples, we can find uh, some confounders are observable or measurable, such as the item brand, and some confounders are not observable or um, measurable, such as the item quality and the recommender algorithm. The next question is that, is it necessary to deal with the confounding effects? The answer is also obviously yes. The goal of recommendation is to estimate user preference, but user preference is implicit. Uh, so we usually estimate the user, estimate the correlation between the UI pair and the click Y as the user preference with a substance that uh, UI matching determines the click. However, if if there is a if there is a there is a confounder between the node i and the node y, the confounding effect will also bring will bring correlations between UI pair and the y. These correlations are not generated by the user item mention. So thus, is the part this part of correlations cannot reflect user preference. So we need to deal with the confounding problem in recommendation. Next. I will first introduce how to deal with the uh, observed confounding issue. To deal with the uh, observed confounders, the boundary adjustment is the uh, obvious selection, and uh, most uh, work takes this technology in recommendation. Existing work appears in recent one to two years, and uh, they consider different confounding issues, issues in recommendation and uh, take uh, different strategies to utilize the final adjustment. I will introduce two representative methods named PDA and uh, XRS, which take different strategies to implement the final adjustment. PDA is a, a work regarding the popular bars. Popular bars in recommendation emphasize two 
aspect. The first one is that the system favorites a few popular items while not giving deserved uh, attention to the majority uh, of the others. The second one is to is that is the amplification of the long tail distribution of the internal items, referring that the popular items are recommended even more frequently than their popularity would warrant. Previous methods blindly remove the popularity bars to purchase uh, an even distribution. But this work points out that popularity bars are not always banned. On the one hand, some items has some items have higher popularity is because of better quality. On the, on the other hand, in some cases, we have the need to introduce some desired popular bars, such as in some cases, we need to promote the uh, items that have the pop potential. Uh, in some cases, we have the need to promote the items that have the potential to be popular uh, in the future. Um, to study what is the benefit of popular bars, this work tries to uh, answer this question from the coastal perspective. First, they find that traditional recommender systems take a common uh, coastal substance that user item matching determines clicks, click as shown in this graph. In this, in this graph, item, item popularity is ignored, but item popularity also has the influence on the recommendation process. To analyze the effect of item popularity, PDA uh, draw the item popularity into the coastal graph as shown in the bottom, uh, in the bottom graph. In this graph, Z is considered as a confounder between I and C. Uh, since item popularity will affect which item to exposure and item popularity will also affect the click probability. Then the confounding effect of the of Z will bring will bring some superior correlation between the user item pair and uh, the click C, leading to the binary effect of uh, popularity bars. Thus, this work proposed to estimate the causal effect PC given do you and the given do I as the uh, user preference to avoid the influence of confounding effect. They take the boundary adjustment to identify the target causal effect, the result uh, is doing here. The right side of the uh, the right side of this equation is uh, is some correlation correlation level objectives, uh, which can be which can be estimated from the distribution of the observed variables. Next, to estimate the causal effect of uh, PC given do you and do I. Uh, in a learning manner, they proposed to, they proposed a deconfounding training uh, method in which there are two ste steps. The first step is to estimate the conditional probability PC given you I Z. The used model is represented by uh, F theta times the value related to item probability of different time uh, different time periods. F theta could be any user item matching model, and uh, the total model is uh, learned with common recommendation laws such as BPR laws. The second step is to utilize the uh, estimate uh, conditional prob uh, probability P single UIC uh, to, uh, to compute the final causal effect P single do you and do I. And the final result is equal to the F, F theta. Besides, they also propose to intervene the uh, no Z and the desired property to inject some desired property bars. The second work, Take RS, is a work to uh, alleviate the bias amplification problem with the confounding. In this work, uh, uh, in this work, bias amplification refers to that items in the majority group are over recommended. For example, uh, in a user history, 70% uh, of the interrupted, uh, in, interrupted movies are anxious movies, but the recommender would amplify the ratio of uh, 
everything move to 90% uh, in the recommendation list. To compare the item in the majority uh, group and uh, the item in the minority group, and showing in the left figure, in the right figure, we can find an item with a low rating uh, in the majority group receives a higher uh, predicting score than the item, uh, item has, uh, has uh, a higher rating within the moder majority group, uh, in the minority group. The former item uh, receives a higher, predict higher predicting score predicting scores just because uh, the former item belongs to the majority group. Intuitively, they think they, they see, this is because user representations uh, show stronger preference to the majority, majority group uh, caused by the uh, model learning process. Then they proposed uh, this course graph to describe the process of model learning under the pre uh, prediction. Here, D denotes the user historical, user historical distribution of, uh, over item group. U denotes the user, uh, user representation and I denotes the item representation. Uh, and um, M denotes describe how much the user likes different item group. It is determined by both D and U. And uh, why represent the prediction scores? Uh, there are two reasons for uh, for that uh, item has has a pre high higher prediction scores. The first reason is that uh, the users choose higher uh, uh, peer preference preference on the item represented by the edge from U to Y. The second reason is that the user choose. Uh, uh, higher interest in the item group uh, represented by the path from U to M and uh, M to Y. Then we can find D is a confounder between uh, between U and M. Uh, it will bring superior correlations, making items and belongs to the superior group in the user histories uh, would uh, have higher prediction scores. Thus, to remove the uh, confounding effect of uh, uh, historical item distribution, they propose to estimate uh, the causal effect P, Y given do U and given I as the recommendation model. Also, according to the boundary adjustment, they identify the target causal effect as this form, which is the weighted sum of conditional pro probabilities P, Y given U, I and uh, given M over the distribution of D. But uh, to, estimate, to estimate the target causal effect, there is a big challenge. The simple space of D is infinite, making the target is hard to be computed. They propose to approximately compute it. First, the, they sample, uh, they sample some uh, historical distributions to rep represent the total uh, space of the D, but with simply, is it still leads to some overall possible the simple historical distribution D, which still cost highly. To solve this problem, they propose to take the sum operation into the uh, function of F like this. Then they represent the target causal effect PY given do you and I uh, with the function of F. Different to PDA, they di directly to take F to uh, fetch data and uh, they think the normal function F could directly output the cause effect. Last, I will I would like to introduce some work regarding the Amazon confounders in recommendation. To deal with Amazon confounders, there are two lines of work: uh, front door front door adjustment based method and the learning substitute method. HCR is a founder adjust, uh, adjustment based method. This work considers the bias problem uh, brought by the confounders that uh, face item attributes and user feedbacks. And they assume that the confounders, the confounders are hard to measure because of uh, technical difficulties or privacy restrictions, such as the item, the item quality of face item price and the rating but the item quality is hard to be quantified. 
please note that not only the uh, bundle adjustment cannot solve the arms of confounding problem, the widely used uh, inverse propensity scoring method uh, also cannot solve this problem since the pro propensities are related to confounders. To deal with the uh, arm absorbed confounding problem, this work I'm trying to use the feedback generation process into coastal graph like this, where I represent at you represent user and L represent uh, the like behavior. And uh, we represent uh, some arm absorbed confounders. Uh, M is a set of mediators between the U at you user item pairs and the like, uh, such as M could be the user item feature matching and the click. To better, to better estimate the user preference value to remove the confounding effect of V. However, with not controllable, we cannot directly block the confounding path opened by the almost of confounder. Fortunately, in this graph, UI pair of phase of L through a mediator M, thus we can take the front door adjustment to uh, solve this problem. The front, the front door adjustment will decompose the causal effect of I on L into two parts of effect. The first part is the effect of I on M denoted by PM given U and do I. And the second part is the effect of M on L uh, denoted by PL given U and do M. Then we can change the uh, we can change the two parts effects together uh, to form the final causal effect as this equation shows. To estimate the causal effect PL given to I and uh, given U uh, with the founder adjustment, we need the two conditional prob probabilities PL given URM and uh, PM given UI. To, es to estimate them, SCR proposed a multi-task learning framework. The first task is to uh, predict M with U and I as input. And the second uh, task is to predict uh, L with U, I, and M as input. As input. The, the two tasks task share the same bottom layers of the layer curve of layer networks. After PM gave U, I, and the P, L, Q, U, I, M have been estimated. They are used to compute the target causal effect. Uh, in their, in their impl implementation, the sum operation over the item I is, uh, uh, can be eliminated with the, a with the, uh, specially designed prediction model S for L like this. The second type of method tries to solve the arms of confounding problem by learning substitute, substitute for, uh, for the confounders. This works uh, usually takes uh, multiple cause or substance for recommendation. They think uh, each, uh, each, user, uh, each user's binary exposure to an uh, item uh, could be a, a cause. Thus, uh, the, ex the exposure to different items forms the multiple cause. And uh, they define two, uh, two confounders. The, the, one, the first one is the multi cause confounders uh, that, that affect uh, more than one uh, exposure. And uh, the second is the single cause confounders, which only affects uh, uh, one expo exposure. In the multiple cause or substance, there are, there are only the multiple cause confounders and they think the singular cause confounders could be ignored. Uh, for the multi cause confounders, uh, they, have a good they have a good property that if we find a, a variable, variable Z, uh, such that condition on Z, then such a condition on Z, uh, then, there, uh, then the exposures becomes conditionally independent to each other. Then there is not any other multiple cause uh, confounders except Z. With this property, we can solve the arms of the confounding issues. First, we need to learn a uh, learn substitute. It is to find a variable Z such that Conditions or the exposures become independent. 
After getting the substitute, we can think controlling the substitute is to is equal to controlling the confounders that method for um, the, for the observed confounders could be utilized. Here are some papers regarding the confounding recommendation for your reference. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce the work regarding the colliding in recommendation. For the colliding in recommendation, the first question is also that are there colliders in recommendation? Uh, uh, the answer is all also absolutely yes. Since in recommendation, there are var var variables uh, affected by many factor, many factors such as the handling of a click is affected by both user preference and the exposure exposition of the item. And uh, uh, what's more, existing existing work even tries to manually construct some colliders uh, to help estimate something. The next, the next question is to utilize or eliminate the colliding effect. To answer the question in this example, assuming that we have known the X2 and uh, try to estimate uh, X1, we know that X and X1 and X2 are independent, uh, thus X, X2 would uh, not uh, provide any information to estimate X1. But if we condition on, if we condition on Z, X1 and X2 would be correlated. Uh, that means condition on Z, uh, X, X2 would uh, provide information to estimate uh, X1. In recommendation, we usually face the similar case, thus existing, existing work based on SM try to utilize the colliding phase to better know some targets. In, in the list, I will introduce two existing studies. Our knowledge, as is the first work to uh, explicitly utilize the colliding effect in recommendation. They think there are two causes for the handling of a click. The first one is the interest and the second one is the conformity, conformity which refers to users tend to follow the mainstream. Uh, thus, failure to distinguish the interest and the conformity to identify the true interest uh, from the uh, user's feedbacks, but it is hard to achieve this goal since, since we lack the ground truth, which means uh, we cannot know the handling of, um, of an intervention is because of only, inter only interest or only, or only because of conformity or only, uh, only or because of both of interest and conformity. This work tries to uh, utilize the colliding effect to help achieving this goal. They draw the corresponding cross graph uh, like this, um, in which the popularity is uh, used to represent the conformity. Uh, in, in this graph, we can find interest and popularity are independent, uh, but uh, condition on click, uh, popularity, uh, popularity and the interest become uh, Become become correlated. Then we have if if a click happens on this popular on this popular uh, item, the handling of the of the click is more likely due to the uh, high interest. Thus, utilize uh, this property is possible to distinguish the interest and uh, the conformity because they provide us information regarding which clicks are more likely caused by the to user interest. Um, based on the mentioned property, the authors, uh, the authors contrast a pairwise interest driven data data denoted as uh, O1, in which an instance contains a user positive item and a negative item. And uh, the, po positive the positive item is less popularity is less popular than the negative one. That means the positive is, that means in this sense, user prefers the negative, the, the positive item is more likely due to the user interest. With this specific pairwise interest uh, driven data set, they proposed a distinctly method. The method has two key points. First, uh, 
the first is to slip user and item representations into two in two embeddings. One is for interesting and the other is for complementary. The second, the second point, which also which is also the most important uh, key point, is to uh, learn the interest embedding on the interest driven pairwise basic of one. The second work uh, utilizes the colliding effect uh, to help the retraining of the recommended system. Thanks in, recommend, thanks in recommendation, the data set is streaming coming willing to use, use the incremental data to update the more recommender model. Usually, when, when retraining, only the uh, increment data is used for efficient retraining in this way. Active users and active items in the recommend data, their represent their, represent, their representations would be updated. However, for the inactive users and the items, their uh, representations will not be updated. This, this will uh, bring in in harmonious between the active and the inactive users and items, leading to the final effect, uh, such as it becomes hard to recommend the inactive items to the active users. This uh, this causal graph describes the uh, uh, corresponding uh, causal mechanisms behind uh, regarding the mode updating with uh, only the incremental data set. As this graph as this graph shows, only the um, uh, the incremental data will only update the anti uh, user representations, and uh, the information in the incremental data cannot pass uh, to the inactive representations. To keep the updates of the anti and the inactive representation, representations be relatively synchronized, and uh, to pass the information in the increment data to the inactive uh, representations, this work proposed to uh, manually create uh, colliders between the inactive and the active representations, uh, denoted as S, and uh, they keep the collider, and uh, when update the model with the uh, only uh, incremental data, they keep the colliders be the similar, be, be the same to the prior, previous colliders uh, in this way. Uh, some relative some relative relations between the inactive representations and the active representations could be preserved, and uh, the the information in the incremental data could uh, uh, pass the, to the inactive representations. Thanks, condition on the colliders, uh, the there is a pass uh, between the uh, increment data it and the inactive representations will be opened. Okay, Tiago, I have introduced the confounding and the colliding in the recommendation list. When Jim will introduce kind of uh, recommendation. Are you here? Hi, there is a question in the chat room. Uh, maybe, I, I guess maybe we can discuss the question here before we just ask this part. Maybe, maybe I, I read the question. So, uh, if I is item characters, so uh, so the, this question is, uh, can, can can you just uh, can you just mute your your microphone and and ask a question by yourself, uh, Masahiro Sato. Okay, okay, okay. So um, I will read his question. So his question is about the uh, it's about the popularity bears item popularity bears and so uh, he asks if I is uh, uh, if I is item characteristics so why uh, what about the the causal relation uh, between I and Z uh, would it be the uh, would would it be the item characteristics to popularity. Uh, you are muted. Okay. Okay, I will share a slide to answer this question. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Uh,
Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, why 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 there is a edge from the item popularity to the I the exposed item? And this and this graph and this figure shows uh for our recommended system it has a feedback feedback loop uh about uh uh the when the data set are, are generated uh uh when when the when the system recommended the uh items to the users the item popularity will influence the which item, uh, which item will be exposed to the, the user? So, uh, the item popularity will affect which, uh, which the, will affect the exposed item. So, thus, this there is a, a, a cost edge between the item popularity and the uh, exposed item. Uh, and I think there there also can there also could be a uh, pass or edge from the user to the item or to, to from the item popular from the item to the uh, uh, item popularity because the attributes of the item and the quality of the item will affect the item popularity. But I think they are uh, uh, these two uh, mechanisms are uh, in different stages of the of the recommender systems and uh, in our in the uh, in the PD, PDR work, only the one stage is considered. Okay, this is my uh, this is my answer. Okay, so let's continue. Sorry, Jara, just wait a minute. I will start sharing. Uh, can you see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, let's start. So, uh, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Wen Jie. Uh, I'm a peer student from AUS. I'm honored to be here giving the introduction about uh, counterfactual recognition. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me and uh, unmute and uh, propose questions if you have any uh, uh, questions to, I can answer it directly. Yeah. So uh, the re for the, as to the counterfactual recognition, the related research on uh, about this in this topic can be roughly divided into uh, four directions. The first uh, one is called the counterfactual inference for recommendation, and uh, the second one is the counterfactual data recommendation, and the last two are counterfactual fairness and the exp and the explanation. The first two are more related to uh, two uh, key technicals, and the last two uh, direction are studied from the apl application pr perspective. So let's first, uh, start from the first research direction, contextual inference. Uh, this work uh, focuses on uh, removing the past specific uh, effect, uh, the past specific effect uh, uh, in the color graph. They are widely used uh, in various uh, recommendation tasks, such as debiasing and uh, OD generalization. Uh, such work will first learn the structural, uh, structural function from data. Uh, the structural functions uh, have been introduced by Zhang Yang. They denotes the uh, functions to describe the color relations between the variable uh, in a color graph, right? So uh, if the model can learn the structural function from the uh, data and then they will estimate the past specific uh, color effect of the treatment variable on the outcome variables. The past specific uh, color effect means that uh, the summer color effect uh, uh, in, uh, in summer specific uh, pass in the, of the color graph. So lastly, this work will uh, identify summer harmful pass specific color effect and on the model prediction and uh, mitigate it during the model inference stage. In this direction, we call it counterfactual inference because the model will imagine, uh, uh, it will imagine a situation where some features are contrary to the factual world, to the factual status. 
for example, some features are not given or some features are changed from the factual value to a counterfactual value. Yeah. So uh, here we detail four uh, rep, uh, classic uh, work. The first one is using counterfactual inference to mitigate the clickbait issues. Uh, clickbait means that uh, for some items, uh, the a user will click uh, this item, but uh, bec only because their attractive title or cover image. Uh, for example, this item too. The item have a, have a very attractive uh, title and uh, cover image, but its content is boring. So when a user uh, click this item, they will find this item is dissatisfying. New recommendation, because there are many clicks uh, over these items, the recommender model will be easy, will be easy to recommend these clickbait items uh, because, they are, uh, because they are attractive exposure features. Uh, cause many clicks over, over this item. So this is unfair to the items with high quality uh, video content, right? So only because they are attractive titles, they will have a click, uh, they will have many exposure uh, prob probabilities. They will have many uh, uh, exposure uh, chance. So it's unfair to item with the high quality video content. So how to reduce the recommendation of the clickbait uh, uh, items? The, the authors uh, utilize the theory of causality to inspect the causal relations between the different uh, uh, features and uh, uh, the model prediction. They distinguish uh, uh, the causal effect of the exposure features and the content features. Exposure features means uh, the, the features the user uh, can see before the click. For example, the title, title and the cover image. The content features mean that the features that the user can see after the click, for example, the video content. So they, they, they can find that uh, here, there, uh, uh, for the model prediction, the exposure and the content features are first uh, extract, uh, the model will first extract the features from both the, uh, use, uh, the exposure features and the content feature, right? They will ex extract uh, such features as the item feature representation. And then they will use this representation to predict uh, the predict uh, the click uh, or play the click or not. So uh, this is a relation between the exposure feature and the content feature and the model prediction. Uh, in this case, there is, we can find that there is a, we find that there is a short cut from the exposure feature to the uh, model pre prediction. It means that, uh, uh, an item can be directly recommended purely because it's attractive exposure features. The prediction score only because only based on the attractive title or attractive cover image uh, is very high. The prediction can be very high. So the items with a, with a attractive uh, title and cover image can be easily recommended. Uh, the idea of the, in this work is to estimate the direct edge of the, the causal effect along this direct edge from uh, E to Y. So they will first uh, learn the structure causal uh, structure functions from the data and then uh, uh, they will estimate the natural direct effect is shorted as NDE in a count factual world to, uh, to estimate the causal effect from E to Y. They, it is to imagine what the prediction score would be if the item only had the exposure feature. It to imagine, uh, it first need to imagine uh, if the item only has the exposure feature, uh, what's the prediction score would be? This is called the direct effect. And it's, if we, uh, and then we can uh, reduce the direct effect from the total effect. The total effect means the, means the effect from the, all the features. And then in this case, we uh, will reduce the effect from the exposure feature and get a better prediction. For example, in this case, item two will have a high uh, NDE because their attractive uh, title or uh, cover image will lead to a high prediction score. And then this score is deducted from the total effect. So the item two is ranked at the last. 
this is work compared with the baselines from the uh, with with the, and without using the post uh, click feedback, for example, like and buy. They will they find that the proposed model CR can effectively recommend the more satisfying items than the baselines by mitigating the clickbait issue. It proves uh, the effectiveness of reducing the uh, the past specific effect by using the counterfactual inference. Uh, uh, so the second work is about uh, mitigating the popularity bias. In the previous PDA work Zhang Yang had just uh, introduced, uh, the, the, the authors will, uh, they will as assume that uh, the, there is a backdoor path from the, uh, uh, from the item to the prediction score by, because, uh, because the confounders say popularity right. But in this work, uh, they will consider it in, in a different way, in different assumptions. Uh, we have known that the, uh, in the popularity bias uh, problem, the small number of items occupy a larger proportion of interactions, right? So the items will have a, a long tail distribution. The popular items are recommended more frequently than their popular uh, uh, would warranty, amplifying the long tail effect. So the previous uh, PDA framework assumes that there is backdoor path from the item to the, uh, uh, to the uh, model prediction. But in this work, they assume that the popularity bias is amplified because the uh, because the uh, I, they will see that because of some item features, they will uh, they also argue that the popularity, the item popularity, is actu actually a feature of the items. So uh, they will want they want to, different items will have various popularity. Also, a uh, popularity can lead to a high prediction score, but uh, uh, they assume that uh, the actually the real prediction score is affected by three parties. One is the matching between the user and the items. It's denoted from the K, U, I, K, 2, 2K, and then 2R. Uh, another is purely affected by the popularity. So it's, um, uh, it's from the U and the I to R, the direct path from U to U, I to R. The, from the path from I to R denotes the uh, captures the popularity effect of the item, uh, from the item popularity to the prediction score. And uh, the path from U to R denotes uh, the user sensitivity to the popularity. For example, some users are more sensitive to the popularity. They will like the, popul they will like the popular, popular items more. So the prediction score is actually the mix up between the matching score and the uh, effect from the popularity. The solution in this work is similar to the clickbait work. They will first train a recommended model to uh, capture the color relations in this color graph. They will first learn the structural functions from data and then perform counterfactual inference to estimate the effect on this direct path because they think that the direct path captures the effect of the popularity, uh, the effect of the pop item popularity. Uh, so they will, uh, they will use the counterfactual inference to estimate the, uh, uh, the effect on the direct path and then they mitigate such a path specific effect to reduce the pop influence of popularity. During counterfactual inference, they estimate uh, uh, the effect of the popularity by blocking the matching paths in a counterfactual world. They will imagine that uh, what is the prediction uh, score would be if there is, if there is no uh, the matching uh, score. So the, if the if these paths are not were not, uh, doesn't uh, exist, so they will first estimate the effect of this direct path, and then they for the final model inference, they will mitigate the uh, estimated direct effect from the total effect of the, all the features. So this is similar to the clickbait work. The proposed solution in this work is also uh, model agnostic. So the, the authors uh, tested uh, two 
uh, representative models, MF and large JSON. The better performance of MACR, MACR is, is a proposed kind of factual inference method. So the, the result shows that MACR shows that simple kind of factual inference uh, strategy can effectively uh, solve the popularity bias. So this is the true work about uh, uh, debiasing recommendation. Actually, another uh, recommendation task by using counterfactual inference is called OOD recommendation. As we all know, uh, recommendation models aim, aim is to learn the user preference from items from user uh, to learn the user preference from users' historical interactions, right? So, however, the user recognition learning is usually based on the ID assumption between the training and the testing periods. It means that uh, the user interaction with items have stable distribution, distribution from the training stage to the testing stage. This is infeasible in the real world scenario, right? Because as time goes on, we, we, the user preference might change and the recommendation policy uh, can also change. So the interaction distribution could be different. Uh, the authors define the OOD recommendation, formally define the OOD recommendation as the change of the user interaction distributions. Here, uh, given you and I, user and item, why it knows whether this user will uh, interact with this item. This uh, probability denotes the probability of, uh, the, of the user interactions, right? So this is a distribution uh, is uh, affected by two factors. One is the exposure mechanism, or you can also call it recommendation policy. It means that whether this is decided by, this, is a, this probability is decided by whether this item is recommended or exposed to this user. And this is the first factor. The second factor is that whether this user will, if the item is exposed or recommended, whether this user will uh, like this item. So uh, I, uh, when interaction happens only and um, only when the user likes this item and this item is exposed to this user. But uh, uh, as, to the, um, prefer, as to the shift of the user interactions, uh, it can also be because of two factors. One is the change of user preference. So in the first stage, I like some high price items, but in the second stage, I like some low price uh, items. So if my preference changes, the distribution will change, right? Um, uh, second factor is that if the recognition policy is changed, so the interaction distribution can also be changed. But um, uh, most of the previous work focused on the second direction. Uh, for example, they study the debiasing recommendation. It also, they, they want to pursue some fair recommendation. So they are adjusting the recommendation policy. Uh, but uh, seldom work considers the first direction, the change of user preference. This work considers a shift of the uh, user preference. They attribute the preference shift to two reasons. One is the change of the observed features. For example, uh, the user age or income changes, the preference will change. So another reason might be because the change of eye observed features. For example, some environmental factors changes. Uh, maybe someday uh, the, uh, the user's mode is bad, right? So it doesn't like anything. So this is a second, uh, fact, second reason. But this work only starts from the first uh, reason, the change of the observed features. So they only study the user preference affected by the a shift of observed user features. So they propose uh, OOD objective for user representation learning. It means that so they ha must have a strong OOD generalization without using any new interactions in the, after the user feature, feature changes. So to achieve the objective, there are uh, two considerations. One is to figure out how the user features affect the user uh, preference. Another consideration is that we must mitigate the effect of outdated interactions. It means that uh, because in the, in the, before the feature changes, we like some items, right? After the feature changes, we like different items. So the interactions before the uh, user feature changes will be 
be will become the outer gate interaction. They will they will not be they will not be consistent with the new user preference. So they will cause them outer gate interactions. We must mitigate the effect of outer gate interactions. So in this formulation, we can uh, for, we can use a color graph to inspect the uh, the interaction generation procedure to find uh, how the user features affect the user preference. We abstract the uh, relation between them in this color graph. User features will affect the user preference and user preference decide the user interactions. The user uh, features are divided into observed and unobserved. Observed are E1, unobserved are E2. So here in this figure, the uh, user preference shift, uh, uh, user preference shift affected by, by the change of observed user features can be formulated as uh, PD given do E, I, uh, uh, E2. So it means that we conduct an intervention, external intervention over the E1 and the first uh, and the change the value of the, uh, this variable. Uh, observe the, the feature of the value of the observed user features. So uh, we can, uh, similar to the previous work, we can learn the structure function from data based on this color graph. We use the VAE framework to learn this structure, structural functions, and then to mitigate the color e the effect of our data interactions. We also use the counterfactual inference. We first estimate the path specific uh, effect on the of the our data interactions and then we mitigate the effect of, uh, of the uh, our data interactions. So from the result, we can see that the performance, first the performance dropped from the ID to OOD setting. It means that the, the distribution shift is quite different, is, is quite large when the user feature is changed. And uh, the proposed COR from a framework can easily uh, uh, achieve strong OD generalization in the OD environments. Uh, the uh, last work in this sub direction is to use counterfactual inference for mitigating uh, field bubbles. Uh, actually, uh, field bubbles means that uh, the recommender will continually recommend. Uh, can recommend many homogeneous items to users, right? They are, they, they are uh, isolating users from diverse contents. Uh, for example, if you click summer uh, micro videos about making coffee, they will continually recommend their summer similar uh, videos to you. So this is called field bubbles. You are stuck in summer local uh, uh, minimum, a local uh, bubble, yeah. So this solution, uh, the solution in this work is uh, to let the user control the field bubbles by directly adjusting the recommendations. In the previous slides, we have introduced the field feedback loop, right? So the user, the user provide feedback, uh, we collect them at the interactions and the interactions are used to train the recommender and the recommender will do inference to generate new recommendations to this user. This is a feedback loop. This work, uh, introduce another loop <clears throat> between users and the system. Sorry. So in this uh, <clears throat> additional loop, the system will tell the user uh, whether they have some issue of field bubbles. Uh, in this case, the users can decide whether they, they, need, they need to, whether they uh, control the or adjust the recommendations. They can directly use some control command to adjust uh, to uh, adjust the recommendation policy. So the recommendation list can be directly changed by users' control. Uh, <clears throat> some uh, cases, some or some examples about user control can be like this. If, uh, for example, if we uh, watch a movie and very like it, we can input the control like more movies like this one. And uh, for, uh, another example is like, for example, more movies like by the young, uh, younger uh, users, some command like that. So uh, in this case, uh, if the users input some control command, but uh, the user uh, history or user historical, user historical interactions 
will be used in this in the, in the original feedback back loop to train the user remutation, right? So the user embedding or user remutation are trained by the historical interactions. Uh, if user input some new control command, the new control command can be inconsistent uh, with the historical interactions. For example, in the history, I like many romance movies, but today I input some control command like more action movies. So action movies will be inconsistent with the romance movies. So in this case, we can also use the counterfactual inference to mitigate the effect of some outdate, uh, some old interaction, some effect of the old interactions. Yeah, this is the work about mitigating field bubbles. Uh, any questions? If no question, I will just move on. Uh, so this is this is the previous four works are uh, using counterfactual inference to mitigate the parse specific uh, causal effect for recommendation. Another direction is about uh, counterfactual data augment data augmentation. Uh, generally, uh, the data augmentation counterfactual data augmentation is uh, claimed to uh, reduce the uh, or solve the problem of data sparsity. They will. Uh, roughly, they can be roughly uh, divided into two categories. One is that one is based on the sequential recommendation, the uh, observed user interaction sequence uh, over time as a factual samples, and they will uh, generate some counterfactual interaction sequence based on some assumptions, and then this uh, augmented counterfactual sample and uh, the factual samples are used to enhance uh, the sequential recommendation. The second category is uh, to uh, simulate, uh, it's not restricted to uh, sequential recommendation. They will simulate the recommendation uh, process and generate some counterfactual samples, including uh, both the items recommended by the model and the simulated user feedback. Yeah, I will introduce this one by one. In the last year's CGR, uh, there are two uh, works on generating counterfactual uh, interaction sequence for sequential recommendation. Uh, this work uh, um, will use the target item uh, to identify the dispensable uh, items and the indispensable items. Uh, this, uh, these items are from the original uh, from the real world uh, interaction sequence of each user. So they will use the target item to identify the dispensable items and the indispensable items. Some indispensable items cannot be discarded. So they, they will uh, keep all the indispensable uh, items and randomly drop some dispensable items. Uh, uh, this is kind of the first kind of uh, counterfactual sample by discarding some dispen dispensable or less important items uh, as a, they will treat this kind of counterfactual sample as a positive counterfactual sample. But they will also generate some negative counterfactual sample. They are generated by discarding some indispensable items. So the, for example, the, uh, these two items are discarded, only keep the two red uh, dispensable items. They are treated as a negative counterfactual samples. Finally, this kind of uh, counterfactual samples and the real world uh, factual, uh, or factual samples are used to uh, enhance the, the original sequential model. Yeah, this is an idea to generate some counterfactual interaction sequence. This work is quite similar, but uh, the, uh, the generation of the, the counterfactual samples is different. They will, uh, this is a real uh, sequential data, and they will use a sample model to sample some more important items. For example, in this case, it's a camera. And then they will find some relevant items with, the camera, with the, this is important item, camera. So they will find some similar items and construct some uh, fake or counterfactual interaction sequence. Finally, this is a kind of counterfactual sequence and the factual uh, interaction sequence are used uh, 
I fit into the um, the uh, sequential model for training. Yeah, this is the idea. Uh, another group of work, uh, uh, they, they also use the um, uh, con uh, counterfactual data combination, but the, they are not restricted to the sequential, sequential set setting. Uh, they will simulate the recommendation uh, process uh, by using the observational data. Uh, by, uh, by, seeing that, uh, by simulating the recommendation process, it means that to train a user model and to train a recommender model, the user model will be used to simulate, simulate the user behaviors and the recommender model will be used to simulate the uh, behavior of the, rec of the previous recommendation policy. So they will train these two models and then it, it actually can be formulated as learning the LCM from the observation data, right? So they will conduct the intervention over the recommendation list R. Ah, it means that uh, given the simulated recommender model, they will uh, do some intervention of the, over this uh, over their generated uh, recommendation list. And then they fit this uh, counterfactual recommendation list uh, to the uh, user model. And the user model will generate some user feedback, right? But they are all, uh, they, are, they all happen in a counterfactual world. They are in the simulation process. So they are called counterfactual samples. This kind of counterfactual samples and uh, the factual samples uh, will be used to train a ranking model. So they will use the both the factual and the counterfactual uh, samples. Yeah, this is the whole idea. Uh, the last two directions are more specific to the recommendation problems about the biasing uh, or, or uh, sequential recommendation, the traditional recommendation task. Uh, as to the last uh, two directions, they are more focused on some fairness and explanation perspective. The first one is uh, the first one uh, fairness. Uh, actually, uh, they have they have been studied well studied in the traditional machine learning domain, right? Uh, many researchers have studied some the, uh, the fairness problem about re regarding the uh, sensitive attributes, for example, age, uh, gender, these sensitive attributes. Uh, in recommendation. Uh, the definition of the counterfactual in, uh, fairness has also been explored. In the recommendation domain, fairness on the user side, on, uh, on the user side, in this work, we only talk about, talk about the user side of fairness. So the user side of fairness can be explained like this. Uh, if uh, uh, it's to pursue the fair recommendations for the users with different uh, sensitive attributes, uh, intuitively, for the users uh, with different ages, they should uh, have they should not be discriminated and should be re should receive uh, fair recommendations or similar recommendations. So, as to counterfactual fairness, it means that uh, for each user, if we change the sensitive, if we change his sensitivity, sensitive attributes from Z to Z prime. The recommendation list should not be changed. Uh, so this is called the this is the definition of the counterfactual fairness. In this uh, CIGA work, they use adversarial learning to remove the sensitive attributes, sensitive information from the user embedding. So they will introduce another task as a adversarial task. Is to push the model fail to recognize or to classify the real uh, sensitive attributes of users. So in this way, they will push the user embedding. Uh, uh, they will the user embedding will be pushed uh, not to include the sensitive information, and the recommendation list will be will not be sensitive to the sensitive uh, to the attributes. Right. The next recognition problem is about uh, explanation. So as to the counterfactual explanation, it's easy to understand uh, in this example. Uh, you were recommended uh, the Godfather 2 because you like good fellers and uh, you like the Godfather 1, right? So this is, uh, uh, otherwise the recommendation 
would have been uh, another uh, movie. So this is the uh, this is the case of counterfactual explanation. Uh, you have done this and this, so we recommend uh, this movie. If you have uh, hadn't hadn't done this uh, these things, we will not recommend this one. So this is called a counterfactual uh, uh, explanation. Uh, Uh, but the counterfactual explanation is different from the matching-based uh, explanation. Matching-based explanation means that to find uh, the historical items uh, uh, that are very similar or uh, that are, or have a high matching score with the recommended items. For example, if we recommend the Godfather 2, they will just find the most relevant items in the uh, user history to provide the, the explanation. This is a matching-based uh, uh, explanation, but the counterfactual uh, uh, explanation is a little bit different. I will use uh, this, uh, the right figure to explain the difference. If we use a simple linear model to rank the items, so for uh, phone A, this is the user preference and this is the item features, we can calculate the uh, matching score between this user and uh, the phone A, right? So the total score of phone A is, is 42. So the most uh, the most uh, relevant feature with the highest uh, matching score is the uh, screen. Screen is the most, uh, is the feature with the, mo with the highest uh, matching score is uh, uh, 18, right? It's 18, right? So, so we can provide the screen as uh, Explanation because you uh you like you very uh, care about the screen and uh, this item has a very uh, score over the screen so we recommend this item to you. This is a matching based uh, uh, explanation. But for counterfactual explanation, it's different because uh, even for for a this uh, uh, screen has a eight, have a matching score over eighteen. For b also have this uh, have a matching score over screen is. Uh, uh, 18. Uh, so um, if we, sl but we can find that, that the, the uh, difference is the battery. Because the phone A has a better battery score, so we rank phone uh, A before uh, phone B. So if we change the battery score from three to 2.1, so phone A will not be recommended again. So actually the full battery is the most critical features for, the, for this recommendation. Yeah, so uh, I don't know whether I have clarified this. The screen is the most, uh, the most relevant feature or the features with the highest matching score, but uh, battery is the most critical feature or the influent feature that decides this uh, recommendation. So, mm, the, to sum up, the aim of the counterfactual explanation is to find the minimal change, the minimal change that lead to a different recommendation. In this case, it's a bit battery, it's a change of battery. So the minimal change are, I, uh, are identified as the most critical uh, features they can be used for explanation. Yeah. Here are the references for the counterfactual recommendation. Do you have any questions? Please feel free to unmute and uh, propose. If no, I will just uh, continue. Okay. So because uh, this is the end of the introduction, intro, introduction of the potential outcome and the SCM based uh, methods, I will briefly compare these two causal uh, frameworks. Generally, they are uh, logically e e uh, equivalent. Uh, most uh, theory and uh, assumptions uh, can be equally translated. Uh, for example, the uh, unconfoundedness assumption in the potential outcome uh, framework, in the potential outcome framework, can be uh, equally translated as, uh, as, to, as uh, uh, for in the SCM framework, they can be understood as uh, for uh, the treatment and the outcome uh, variables the conditional variable blocks all the backdoor parses. So in this case, 
is unconf uh, is can be called unconfirmness. But uh, in the uh, political outcome, it have different discretion. Discretion, but uh, the uh, underlying uh, theory is the same. Yeah. Uh, but as there are some difference between these two frameworks, uh, LCM is more intuitive because we will use a color graph to describe the uh, fine grained uh, color relations between each between the variables, right? Uh, but it's also need, uh, but the cost is that it need, it need uh, uh, the more fine grained uh, assumptions between the variables to specify the color relations, uh, right? So, but potential outcome uh, can are uh, easy to potential outcome framework is easy to capture some assumptions that are not uh, that can't be that can't be uh, naturally represented by graph. I use an example to explain the difference. Uh, here, to estimate the causal effect of the treatment variable t on the outcome variable y. If we want to estimate the effect of T on Y, uh, SCM will uh, first assume the relations between these variables X1, X2, X, oh, sorry, it's purple, this is X3. So X1, X2, X3, and uh, the relations with, between uh, the T and Y. So the SCM must uh, describe the color relations by using a color graph, right? In the, if we know the, this is the, uh, underlying causal relations, we can control X1 to uh, block the backdoor path from T to Y. So we can estimate the causal effect of T on Y, right? But uh, a potential outcome can directly control X1, X2, and X3. They don't know, they don't need to know the fine grained causal relation between these variables. They can just control uh, X1 and X2 and X3. They will also block all the backdoor passes and uh, they don't know the, they don't need to know the fine grained correlations. So this is uh, uh, this is a uh, difference between these two frameworks. Yeah, this is all from my part. Do you have any questions? If no, I will pass, uh, pass to okay. Lee. He will introduce the final section. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay. Okay, so I will introduce, uh, I first give a brief summary of, uh, of the, the existing, of the current code recommendation, for, uh, recommendation works, and then uh, uh, introduce some open problems and different directions. So, uh, as, as introduced, uh, as we have introduced, uh, so uh, we can conclude. We can first conclude that so uh, incorporating caudal, uh, caudal or caudal techniques or the this uh, this kind of caudal inference methods into recommendation can indeed bring uh, better recommendation uh, regarding whether uh, regarding the aim. Um, to the bears or, or the aim to pursue fairness or the aim to enhance the generalization. Um, but uh, because our uh, our tutorial is uh, the lim the time limited uh, of our tutorial is very limited, so we only uh, we only uh, we only cover a few uh, a few perspectives about about color recommendation. And there we admit that there are many other research about uh, color recommendations. And here I want to uh, represent the uh, organizers to apologize for not covering all. And uh, we, we would like to revise this tutorial uh, continuously. Uh, if you have any uh, suggestions or if you want to suggest any works, uh, please kindly let us know. And the second uh, point for conclusion is that so, um, Based on the the current development of color uh, color recommendation, so our suggestion is that so if you uh, if you are solving uh, solving any uh, recommendation problems, maybe you can try uh, try to solve it from uh, from a color perspective, just like the previous works. And as just mentioned by Wenjie, so there are. 
two, generally there are two frameworks for code recommendation. One is based on potential outcome. Another one is based on uh, structured code model. So uh, for these uh, two frameworks, they, both of them have has their uh, special uh, property. For example, code, uh, uh, for example, the, IC, uh, the ICM framework needs to uh, draw a code, code graph uh, first. And, um, and, uh, and for the potential outcome uh, framework, and we need to, uh, we need to uh, develop some methods to estimate the, the probability score. And so, uh, because there are two frameworks for color recommendation, and they have different properties, so how, uh, so how to choose between these two uh, frameworks? Our suggestion is that, so, um, because they are theoretically they are equivalent, so uh, you can just choose uh, choose any one of them uh, regarding your requirements. For example, if you you want uh, you want a solution with uh, with uh, with uh, some uh, theoretical foundations, then uh, maybe a potential outcome is a better choice because uh, all the assumptions are clearly presented in a formal way. Um, so these are these are all the conclusions for the cousin uh, problems, and here are some uh, here are some here are. Uh, some of source of uh, from us about the future directions. So because uh, we are on the view of building a, a recommended model, so this is the main a main job of uh, of of us. So we focus on this type of this feedback loop. And as to training a recommended model or building building such a model, there are many uh, three main steps. First, uh, we need to uh, we need to we need to we need to construct some causal uh, assumptions. About this, about the data, and then we need uh, we need some some techniques to model to modeling the data, and then we we uh, we also need some uh, some methods or some, and some metrics to evaluate our model so that, so that we can optimize the we can optimize the the, the, the model parameters and we can uh, jump whether uh, we can conduct model selection. And so uh, we also present the future uh, future directions uh, from this. Uh, we also split the future directions from this uh, uh, from these three uh, three perspectives. Uh, about causal assumption, uh, as we mentioned, as of course mentioned, the both the call, uh, potential outcome and structured causal model uh, frameworks require uh, require assumptions, require causal assumptions. Uh, for example, the potential outcome-based methods need to choose the covariance to satisfy the unexchangeability assumption, and the structured causal model uh, needs to manually draw the causal graph. But um, here is an open problem about how to obtain a proper causal how to obtain proper causal uh, assumptions for recommendation. I think we all know uh, the recommender system is actually a very complex environment. For example, there are multiple spec, uh, there are multiple spec, uh, stakeholders, um, including the users, the, cu the customers, the users, and the, uh, the content or item providers, and also the the system, uh, the system or the uh, platform de developers, and uh, there are there are very complicated uh, interactions between all of this, uh, all of this, uh, of these stakeholders. At the same time, the, the, the whole system is, you, is, is not isolated. It, it is affected by uh, many, uh, uh, many factors outside the, outside the system. For example, the, uh, the social events uh, and, the, and the economies and, and the, the economy status, so on and so forth. Uh, but for, uh, for but our but the, all of this uh, but we we don't have uh, about as uh, recommender uh, or as re recommender builders or system developers uh, we actually we don't have or uh, we don't have sufficient knowledge with with all of these factors. So uh, how to how to, how to obtain proper causal assumption to describe such a complex environment is uh, is still a, a, an open problem. Regarding this open problem, a future direction uh, is 
uh, incorporating color discovery into a recommendation. So uh, that is to say, before we training a recommended model, we uh, we uh, we conduct color discovery. For example, by applying some uh, existing color discovery algorithms over the recommendation data, and with with this uh, with this color discovery algorithms, then we can we can get the color graph. Uh, we can get the color graph to, uh, of, of this uh, recommended system. But this is, uh, this is not trivial because, um, uh, because directly uh, applying the existing color discovery algorithms to recommendation uh, faces several challenges. First, uh, the existing color discovery algorithms typically uh, can only handle a few uh, variables, but uh, in recommendation, we face very high dimensional inputs. For example, in some CTR uh, clicks rate uh, prediction scenarios, uh, the input features, the dimension of input features can reach million, even higher. Um, uh, with such high dimensional inputs, the existing uh, method cannot handle it. Um, uh, at the same time, there are many hidden uh, variables affecting the uh, generation of recommendation data. But these uh, variables are not uh, are not uh, recorded by the system due to technical issues. For example, uh, for a recommender system, it is unworkable to record all of the social events that can affect the behaviors of users. And uh, due to the privacy restriction, the recommendation, uh, the, the, it is also hard for the recommender system to, um, to record the very detailed uh, status of the users, for example, the mood of the user. So there are many hidden variables uh, affecting this system, and these uh, this hidden variables are all uh, problems for the color discovery algorithm. And there is, uh, in addition to this, the, the, the challenge about the input, there is another, uh, there is another challenge about you uh, applying existing color discovery algorithms in, uh, in recommendation. Um, this is uh, the, the, the existing uh, color discovery algorithms. They uh, typically uh, typically output uh, not only one specific color graph, but a set of uh, a set of uh, a, a set of uh, color graphs. For example, uh, and so uh, um, so it, it means that there isn't any, there isn't any uh, Color discovery algorithm that can output a perfect color graph for for recommendation. There, they can only uh, they can only uh, they can only construct or discover uh, discover a few uh, color graphs that are close to the perfect color to the perfect one. But uh, any of the discover uh, color uh, color graphs may have some problems or may may have some mistakes. So um, we are facing the uh, the challenge of unreliable color graphs in the uh, in recommendation. And uh, this so this this is uh, uh, this is about the color assumption and and uh, as to the modeling the second step of the modeling part. Um, Actually, existing color recommend methods, they, uh, uh, the existing color recommend methods only focus on one training step. However, um, as we uh, emphasize a lot, recommendation is not a one shot deal. So it is a feedback loop. And the factors like popularity, they not only influence the current, uh, the current training step, it can also influence the uh, the following uh, data collection step, and so uh, here comes uh, the second open problem that is that is how to model the color effect of feedback loop. Uh, regarding the uh, regarding this uh, problem, one potential uh, direction is the temporal uh, color modeling. So the 
as shown in this uh, in this part. So uh, the current this is the current this is the uh, this is well this is a, a static uh, color graph color graph used in the existing color recommendation methods. And from a temporal view, we can expand all of these variables a long time, and then we can we uh, consider cons uh, consider the connections uh, along different uh, time steps with uh, temporal relative factors. And beyond the uh, beyond the feedback loop, another uh, another problem about the uh, about color modeling is that. Uh, regardless of uh, what color graph or what um, what color techniques is introduced uh, into uh, color recommendation, so um, most of the, the most of the existing methods still rely on the deep neural network to learn uh, latent representations of users and items. However, the such neural networks are all black balls, and uh, which makes the latent representations unaware about the uh, about the about the causal relations so here comes another uh, open problem that is how to learn causal representation in uh, for recommendation uh, it means uh, how to make the latent representation of users and items be aware of uh, causal relations between the uh, between the uh, variables that that will affect the, the final uh, the final uh, interaction. Regarding this uh, this target, uh, we have several challenges to be uh, solved. The first one is grounding. That is to say, uh, how we align the latent variables uh, of neural network with the variables in color graph or the uh, variables we are interested in. And the second challenge is uh, how to to, uh, how to make the uh, the huge graph neural uh, the huge neural network to be modularity, and um, this is because uh, according to uh, according to color relations, we can actually decompose all of the uh, variables related to recommendation into into different parts that are independent, but. Uh, when we uh, model this, when we uh, encode this data with a huge neural network, uh, uh, appear uh, obviously such neural network cannot uh, cannot decompose all of these independent parts. And another uh, moreover, there. Uh, the existing code recommend methods require a lot of uh, manual operations. For example, uh, we need to uh, to build a code recommender model. We need to first uh, uh, de manually define a set of code assumptions. For example, drawing a code graph, and then we manually uh, derive the uh, derive the uh, the the underlying. Uh, 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 underlying distributions to uh, to calculate the, the expected estimate, and then we build models for each of these underlying uh, underlying uh, probabilities to to learn or to 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 estimate the probability and then calculate the target target estimate. But um, uh, as this process uh, requires many uh, manual operations, and so. Uh, uh, an open problem is how to reduce the cost of human efforts for building a causal recommender model. And, uh, regarding this problem, a potential direction is to introduce the auto uh, the techniques of auto ML uh, into causal recommendation, and so we can we can make uh, so that we can build a fully automatic optimized uh, uh, workflow. Uh, finally, uh, regarding the evaluation step, there are still uh, there are still uh, 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 big uh, problems. Um, for all of this, for the for for the existing actually uh, for the existing uh, call or recommendation work, there lacks uh, there lacks uh, a standard there lacks a, a standard uh, evaluation protocol, and different uh, different paper uh, takes. Uh, 
takes uh, very different uh, evaluation protocols. For example, they may uh, sample the test, uh, some paper may sample the test set uh, according to sample variables, and then uh, another paper may sample the, uh, may uh, preprocess the uh, training set with another uh, strategy. And the reason of this uh, of this situation, uh, we, we, we call the one sort of paper, one sort of evaluation protocol situation is because um, the, uh, the well-defined evaluation protocols in uh, previous recommend, uh, recommend uh, uh, previous work about recommendation uh, and machine learning uh, is not suitable uh, for the evaluation of causal recommendation. For example, some previous work used the uh, random, uh, random split of training and testing data. And so in that case, we cannot, uh, we cannot test whether, whether the model suffers from bears or whether the model can generalize to uh, all these situations. So, uh, the, so uh, how the recommendation works uh, propose a lot of different uh, evaluation protocols. And so regarding this situation, uh, we think uh, well, we think the the key uh, the key research problem is what is, what are the standards for causal recommendation evaluation? That is to say, is there any rules for uh, for for a evaluation for an evaluation protocol? For example, if you if this evaluation doesn't obey this rule, then this evaluation is not suitable. Um, regarding these uh, directions, actually, we we don't have a uh, we. We don't have a uh, we don't have a clear source about uh, about such rules, um, but we we think there are two uh, two important uh, two important things for for building such rules or for building such standards. The first one is is building benchmark data sets. And another one is is uh, is design is uh, is design is the design of causality of where evaluation metrics. For example, um, for example, we can uh, we can uh, we can we can develop uh, uh, metrics uh, in addition to the widely used, uh, uh, for example, NDCG or uh, or recall. This kind of and this kind kind of uh, metrics. Uh, that focuses on the binary, binary, uh, binary feedbacks, and uh, beyond this kind of binary feedbacks, maybe we can develop uh, metrics regarding the causal effect of recommendation, which will focus on, for example, the maybe the the gains, uh, the gains the, or the uh, the uh, profit of uh, making a recommendation. Um, uh, another example about this matrix is the past is, is about the past statistical fairness. For example, uh, for for the current uh, valuation matrix for fairness, uh, they they mainly focus on whether this uh, whether some sensitive uh, attributes uh, uh, affect the recommendation result or not. But uh, we can delve into the causal relation to define more accurate uh, metrics for fairness. For example, in this case, uh, for example, in this case, we denote uh, we denote the uh, the gender of uh, of uh, the we denote gender as Z, uh, which actually uh, affects the uh, the recommendation of job opportunities. Uh, directly or uh, affects the uh, job recommendation uh, through the ability for example uh, for example if uh, if the job is about uh, a, 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 uh, is uh, labor intensive maybe uh, maybe it is more suitable for 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 a, uh, for a male uh, for a male employee so uh, for this kind of situation, uh, the the variable has two uh, passes to affect the the the, the target the outcome variable. And when we pursuing uh, fairness uh, for the recommendation, maybe uh, our target should be remove the uh, remove the uh, 
remove the direct effect uh, from this direct path uh, instead, uh, instead of removing the, uh, the natural effects uh, on, the, on the ability of the employee uh, and which finally, which naturally affects whether the, the employee is suitable for this, uh, for this job. So uh, that's all for uh, for our tutorial. Uh, thanks for listening. And finally, uh, there is an advertise uh, we are hiring. So that's all. Thank you.